many of us uh, have a year ahead and a summer ahead of uncertainties. And the commercial realities of that sometimes can get washed over with words of wisdom from our leadership. So therefore, I've got uh, to close the show, Rob Hewitt, uh, Chair of Farmlands Cooperative and Mel Scrimmager, the Director of Category from Farmlands, both here with us on Serious Country. Kia ora. Thank you so much for coming on the show, gentlemen. I know you'll be hanging out for a cold beer in your hot offices right at the moment. I really appreciate it. I'm looking at one right now, sir. <laughs> I've away. I don't put it past you. Thank you so much, uh, Rob and and Mel, for being on the show. And now, Mel, I'm just going to start with you. It was the privilege of, of, of spending some time with you at the Farmland Supplier Awards, and I got a real insight into the what we don't see uh, a lot of, which is the the absolute resilience uh, in our commercial rural businesses and how they were able to navigate COVID. Can you share us about your experiences um, dealing with them individually and how they came through that? Yeah, great question. Um, well, COVID was the challenge that no one wanted, obviously. Um, and one thing I think some of our farmers uh, perhaps forget, arguably, is that uh, if our suppliers don't supply us, then we've got nothing. We're heavily reliant on them. Uh, we call them supplier partners because they are partners in business. They're part of our supply chain. In terms of leadership, um, there's a little aviation quote I like to um, like to recite. There's three words they use. Uh, first of all, aviate, keep things flying. It's not good when your plane doesn't fly. So in a crisis, keep the business working. And that was a, that was a, a real uh, collaborative effort with the supplier community. Uh, we all had to aviate together. We all had to make everything keep moving. Uh, and that meant working with MPI and getting uh, <coughs> uh, status for the, for the suppliers to be open and manufacture and distribute. Um, and then secondly, navigate, work out where you're going. Uh, and uh, sometimes those time frames are quite short. Uh, they might be a day or a week. Um, they're not sort of three year plans. So keep the plane flying and make sure you know where you're going. And then finally communicate. Uh, and, and that's sort of the order. Uh, it might seem uh, counterintuitive not to communicate first, but you've got to know what you're communicating and where you're going. And, and those those sort of three words were, were a driving force for us. Um, we kept uh, informed with our supplier community and we made sure that um, we were all aviating together as one happy family. And, and look, that, that worked well for us. Mm. Rob, so on that aviation theme, uh, I mean, there was certain companies such as Air New Zealand and Kathmandu that really struggled through this because they were so heavily indebted. In this, in the primary sector, we're quick to say, why are you not passing on the profits and the structure around some of our primary sector organisations? Um, how is it in navigating the, the books in terms of um, adversity and, and experiences you've had this year? Yeah, it's been an interesting one, as Mel said, the one we didn't want. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that from a from an ag perspective, and I will freely admit that we have had the privilege of being essential services. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, is a governor on a number of businesses that weren't essential services, and I can tell you the conversation he would have would be quite different to mine. Uh, look, I think we have come through this uh, very nicely, uh, really, when you consider what the alternatives could have been. Now, that's not to say it's been easy. That's not to say that we have produced results anywhere near the budget that we thought we were going to, but we are still here. We are still relevant. And in many cases, we haven't taken subsidies uh, or we've just taken what the minimum that we needed to to get through. And uh, and I think, you know, that the ag thing, uh, New Zealand, I think, my, my view around COVID and subsequently is that consumers, as they were locked down around the globe, and you know you just need to look around the world today, Germany is about to wake up uh, any time now and they will find themselves staring at the walls for another until the 10th of January. Uh, so this is going on around us. Um, while people are in that space, they spend a bit of time thinking about things and, uh, and they worked out that their food chain, their food supply chain wasn't as secure as they thought it was. In fact, they'd given it very little attention because it was in the supermarket when they turned up to go and buy the product. Um, that that degree of confidence, uh, it took a bit of a hit, and they they revert um, to safety. And New Zealand's been seen around the globe increasingly, certainly among the consumer set that we wish to trade with, as being not only a safe supplier of food, but a safe supplier of safe food. And uh, and this is standing up in good stead. So. You know, you look around the globe, I, 
So, uh, my, my favourite comment at the moment is strategy is one thing, but right now strategy is sort of parked over here. You know, it's doing the do and getting it done and being quite tactical with a mind to how do you keep those supply chains open and uh, and get the product through. And uh, and that's been consuming a lot of time. But broadly speaking, New Zealand agriculture has done that pretty bloody well. And um, and and we're seeing the benefit of that. New Zealand is emerging, and you know it's not just been ag. I think I think our prime minister, whether you whether you've got a red dress on or a blue dress on, it doesn't really worry me. I think from a from a global perspective, she has marketed our country particularly well, and that's another reason why consumers globally look to New Zealand as a as a safe p- supplier of high quality produce. They they are receptive to us because we've got something they don't. Mel, you deal with a range of different supplier partners, uh, whether international bases or here in New Zealand, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about the level of New Zealand agriculture carrying on as business as usual from an international global partner's perspective. Has that started to settle down and and, and seeing supply chains uh, open up for our rural supplies um, and the confidence building here that New Zealand is, as I said, business as usual? Not really. I wish I could report a little bit differently there, but that's not quite how it's appearing. What, what's actually happening is uh, there's not enough containers, as you may have heard, around the world. Um, the containers, or well, enough containers, are in the wrong places. And unfortunately, um, for New Zealand, we get left off um, we have ships that, that um, I think it's called a blank sailing. They don't actually turn up here at all. So uh, in the short term, our supply chain is, is safe. Um, we have enough products uh, in country that will see us through. Um, a two-week delay, there was a Radio New Zealand report that two-week delays are going to cause an issue. They're not really. There's enough product in country. Uh, the medium term, I guess, if you want to sort of talk about the middle of next year, uh, if those supply chains aren't sped up and resolved, we will have some, uh, or possibly have some, some supply chain challenges. So, uh, yeah, the, the global context doesn't see New Zealand as being hugely important in the global realm. Um, and it's really for us getting stuff out of China and getting it in a timely fashion. So rather than saying it, there is a crisis, because there's not one, uh, but having gone from secure supply chain that we were confident with all the time, I'd now rate us as possibly having some issues. I find some optimism in that. I can find in anything. Um, Rob, I want yeah. to I want to end on some comments that Chris Parsons and Lindy Nelson just when we were talking about um, leadership there is about nurturing and bringing through future leaders. How important is it to have transformational thinking with the challenges we have ahead of us in twenty twenty one? How much time have I got? <laughs> as long as you like. <laughs> Uh, look, I think yes, but it's not a, it's not the only thing. You know, I, I think something that uh, the next generation of farmers in New Zealand need to um, need to understand and 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 stand and have their hand up for is that uh, if they don't want to go into leadership positions in the future, if they aren't prepared to step up, they will get what they get. I am a big fan of cooperatives. I chair two of them, and uh, and they are integral to my business. And I am firmly of the view that as a farmer, you need to own a slice of your supply chain, or you will be dictated to. It's the only way that a, a group of many small suppliers can redress the balance of power. So, New Zealand <clears throat> agriculture and the New Zealand economy is really reliant on cooperatives, ag co-ops. As farmers, we own this. We need to govern them is to the best of our ability, we need people to put their hands up. Now, I admit there's, there's never a good time to want to become a governor of a business. I can remember my own situation when I was 38, being approached to stand on the board of Silver Fern Farms, or PPCS as it was at that stage. And I said to the guy who approached me, I said, oh, look, Robbie, I'll, um, I thought about that when I was sort of 50, and, you know, the kids are away and the farm is, uh, is all uh, done and dusted and I'll be looking for a fresh challenge. And Robbie said, well, the time might be now. And I think the time is now, and this is an evergreen thing because we we need leadership, continued leadership, and part of that leadership is transformational change, as you talk about, but that's not the only part. Um, my view is the co-ops are doing a better job of developing governance talent uh, amongst their shareholder base, but it is we, we've started from a hell of a long way behind, and businesses at the same time are getting more complicated and complex. 
I think farmers, uh, as there are very, very good businessmen, many of them, and women running farms and running agricultural products and uh, services as well. They need to put their hand up because New Zealand won't be as good a place as it is now if we don't. And uh, we need diversity. We need young people coming through and we need them to be self-starters. And I think what people will find, if they do put their hand up, there will be all sorts of help coming to them to get them into a position where they're confident and capable enough to do what they need to do. Rob, I want to echo what you just said there because I have a lot of 35-year-old sheep and beef farming friends who are complaining about the price of strong wool, which you have an influence over. And I say, well, my uncle at the same age got off his us and did something about it when it came to New Zealand Merino. And so therefore, I don't actually believe that, um, you know, crying in the in the wallows around the edges is, is something that is, should be aspirational. And I really echo what you just said there, absolutely 100%. And as I said, I signed up to an Agri-Women's Development Trust governance course today uh, to actually show that leadership because, I mean, I want that for all of my friends at my similar age uh, as you were at 38. So thank you very much for saying that. Um, Mel, there's been some transformation, let's be honest, at Farmlands over the last year or five uh, coming. But the thing is, is that these businesses are not going to be what they were of the past. Uh, There is a new future in the way that our rural supply businesses operate to be uh, there to support um, farmers and growers into the future. Uh, What are some of the learnings that you have taken from the transformation of farmlands? Well, quite a few learnings, really. Um, One is that um, it's painful. Uh, It's necessarily painful. You do have to reinvent yourself, and and farmlands is coming through that. Uh, I guess when you start these processes, you go through a bit of a J curve. So you know where you're at, and you actually tend to go backwards slightly before you can leap forward. And and as you leap forward, you're on the the upward angle of J, and that's where we find ourselves now. We're starting to uh, to do that. I think with the technology, um, sort of almost echoing the leadership uh, commentary that uh, you and Robert just had, a lot of the answers are in the industry already. We know what to do, <clears throat> and, excuse me, and as a group, um, I think you're going to see technology um, become uh, the, the bedrock on which we start to build uh, new businesses and, and new ways of thinking. Uh, the connectivity between uh, a producer, a farmer, a grower, uh, and their suppliers, which is um, facilitated by the likes of farmlands and, and our competitors, and then the, um, the cooperatives that Rob uh, represents in his other role in terms of uh, Silver Fern or, or PNG. Uh, I think the integration across the industry is going to grow really rapidly. Uh, and we're always going to have a New Zealand Inc. Uh, working together. And the technology is the enabler for that. So I think the lesson is that uh, if I think about suppliers and, and retailers, we used to, back in the dim, dark days, we used to be combative. It was how much we could screw each other. And then there's been collaboration. And I think we're moving into a new stage, which I would term ecosystems, which is actually working off uh, the strengths we all have. So rather than beating each other up and trying to win, trying to work more as one. And I think you're going to see more and more of that happen. What an awesome way to end. But I have to both ask you, uh, of course, which way you're going to hang up your boots and how you actually take some time to turn off the cell phone and recharge that battery. Rob? Uh, active uh, active relax, relaxing. Before I go there, I'd just like to echo what Mel yeah. said. And, and, and since you, you said that I am all godlike in the strong wool sector, which I'm not, by the way, I don't have any <laughs> influence over Christ, thank you. Uh, but I certainly would like to uh, <clears throat> put something in place that lifts it. Um, look, a, a good example of collaboration uh, that I can uh, report on right now is that uh, the Strong Wool Action Group is working very closely with Rons and uh, the Campaign for Wool. Uh, to deliver an outcome that we all want. So, you know, this ecosystem thing is alive and well and uh, and needs to be. We're too small a country. We're too good a product set to, to bugger around fighting each other. The competition's out there, not here. But anyway, to answer your question, um, I'm off to the beach soon. I, I get Zoom up there, so I haven't quite finished. I will be I will be growing a scungy beard. My kids tell me uh, that I, I <clears throat> don't look particularly attractive. Well, even less so. Uh, but uh, I, I choose to uh, actively grow a, a patchy beard, which would be greyer each year, and just spending a bit of time with family, kicking back. So uh, that'll be me. 
and, uh, and a few mates, but doing not a lot. Chuck the cell phone in the bottom drawer and um, do a bit of swimming. Now? Well, uh, I'm off to the sounds um, with friends. I'm on a weight loss mission, but the problem is we eat and drink a lot, so I'll have to restart. I think I'm like one of those people that stopped smoking, reporting my weight losses, but you're never quite sure what the base is that I'm coming from. <laughs> I've typically lost two or three kilos, but um, I keep adding on to lose the two or three. So it's a bit of a challenge. So after the sounds with the family and friends and, uh, and like Rob, I'll have the, uh, the cell phone pretty much chucked away for a couple of weeks. There is something so unique about the sounds that's resonating across this entire program. I'll be heading that direction as well. It's just that the smell of the bush, just the reconnecting with nature. I mean, we farming and growing are, are doing that every day, but actually removing yourself from your workplace is um, is, is just the change that you, you do need. And, and sometimes it's not. Um, Rob, just, sorry, I just do want your thoughts to young people, similar age, who are working their asses off, haven't had a holiday in years, and you're been through that and actually say, is it really worth it? And and what is the importance of actually taking that time? Yeah, I, I've always subscribed to a change is as good as a holiday and, and, and maybe that's environment um, and maybe it's just doing something different. So, yeah, look, if you can afford to get away, do. But getting away might be just going to town for a day and going to a movie or or, or even – forgetting to put the key into the quad bike and go for a walk around your farm instead of going for a bloody ride because you're usually busting your ass from one job to the next. Just take some time out and uh, and look up the creek or um, or go for the walk and admire the view. You know, it's it's doing things differently. I it's, It is refreshing. Look, if you can get away, I think that's great. You know, there's, there's too many people get it's, it down in the spiral and we're bloody busy here. Christmas comes at completely the wrong time, mm. but isn't the weather good? So um, try and track the most of it. And in the meantime, Sarah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to both of you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for taking the time to join us. Mel Scrimmager, the D- Director of Category at Farmlands and the Chair of Farmlands, Rob Hewitt, joining us there on our last edition of Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country.